Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release, the newest, most definitive edition of the entire video game industry. It's currently June 1982, and we were playing, we were reading Electronic Games Issue 4. Let's get back into it. Here we go. It is time to read. I wouldn't leave you hanging after the last episode. We want to continue and see what else we have to see in the Electronic Games magazine. Starting with the last part we talked about was the top picks of Electronic Games picked hits. Uh, you can see here we have the top or best games that they have gone through. Let's flip on to our next page. There we go. This is a giant spread. This is a big ad from South Pacific Video. More for you in 82, where we are right now. The games people play. 20 billion quarters poured last year into arcade monsters, and I wonder where they get these stats from, because as we've read electronic games, they've said how many quarters are being thrown in, but I don't know for sure what it is, if it's an accurate count. But here it is again. For the very first time, we've, they've revealed ColecoVision to us, and there is the specs. Nice. Software from the past fits the hardware of the future. Conversion module number one allows you to play current games on new uh, cartridge releases for the VCS. So before the system is even out, they're advertising that it's going to be able to be able to play Atari VCS games. I don't I'd love to know what Atari would be thinking at this point. That's amazing. And then we also have the. Over here on the bottom left and is the ad for the Commodore VIC-20. Two joysticks capable of eight-way directional movement. Advanced 12-function keyboard. Very nice. And then we also have all the other titles by ColecoVision down here on the bottom. Oh, man. The Donkey Kong version that's going to be coming out soon. So all this is the preview. Getting you pumped up. Because this is the beginning of summer. By the time we reach August is when the ColecoVision will release. At least what I've heard from publications. And over here on the right side, we have uh, more stuff by Coleco. Telling you what's hot, what's not. We've already seen Night Stalker. I haven't seen Tron yet. I didn't tag that one as a release yet or Lock and Chase yet. But here's some early screenshots from it. We have seen Chopper Command by Activision and uh, Star Master. Well, actually, I don't think we've seen Star Master yet. It's so exciting. And we have over here Donkey Kong. That is going to be the big one whenever they get released. And they even have some contests for you. Very nice. Let's flip on to the next page, which is the Test Lab. And here they're going to break down and talk about the Astro console. Originally the Bally Astrocade. Now it's called the Astro Vision after it got um, a new company that took over. And we have a game called Solar Conqueror, which we haven't seen yet. And Coloring Book, I don't think we're even going to be playing here on the channel. And so we have the controllers they talk about. That's just a nice touch. And you can see it says Videocade. Is that what they got that instead of Astro Vision? Or that's the next person that took over? Because th this console went through three different name uh, variations. And then we also have the what, what's built in, Gunfight and Checkmate. We played all that on the channel, too. Let's flip on to the next page. The Q&A section. Also, the troubleshooting section. People write into the magazines and say, I have some problems with my console or computer, and I need help. And they do the troubleshooting here in the magazines because that's where you're going to go. This is where you go for the latest news, tips, and tricks. And I'm getting a current video uh, disconnect where it's not allowing me to see my... Uh, chat screen. So give me one sec because I'm not able to see any chats that currently come in. Let's do this. That's better. Okay, now I can see any chats that come in. Very nice. All right, so here we go. We have a nice picture of the Centipede Arcade Cabinet in all its glory. Oh, it looks fantastic. So th some of the things they bring up, the first question they have is, uh, if I run my television for 10 to 12 hours, it, its brains get hot. Should I give it a break to move its power supply inside, leaving the brains more room? And the answer is 10 to 12, 10 to 12 hours. You're playing video games for 10 to 12 hours? Holy high res. You need to give that master component a rest. <laughs> rest. Yeah, if you're playing that long, um, I know I had lots of friends that would play Atari and try to go for high scores, so they would keep their game going as long as they could. And I don't think we stayed or played that long, though. That's that's pretty extreme. And next question is, I was buying an Atari VCS, but read in the second issue of the magazine that Atari's soon beginning production on a super video game system. Should I wait and buy 
the, uh, that system or go ahead and get the available VCS, which is hilarious. The super video game system they're talking about will eventually be the Atari 5200. And then they say, how fickle these electronic gamers are. Sure, the new Atari uh, uh, Super game looks great, but that shouldn't diminish the, uh, the luster of the VCS. Yes, buy the VCS. Do not wait for the 5200 if I could go back in time. And then they list all the games, look at that, that you could play on the VCS right now. Could you explain to me why the graphics displayed on my TV via the home programmable do not compare to the video games in the arcades? Why can't I get arcade quality games at home? <laughs> All right, I just saw Curtis Boyle in the chat. Three to four weeks at a time to win some event. Nice. <laughs> you just kept it running? That's great. And this is fun. They're explaining here why you can't have arcade at home. But that's a legitimate question. Why? It's obviously because they're making systems at home, the consoles, to run lots of different games when the arcade's made for just one. So question, what exactly is the difference between high resolution and low resolution? Check this out. At the time, they say the strict definition for high resolution is 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. But for video games, the standards are not nearly so exacting. Anything regarded as high res. Most programmable video games are low res, while others, such as in television sports games, are regarded as high resolution in terms of the graphics. It was a gray area. There wasn't a definitive way to describe high resolution, but it's hilarious that now they say in 1982, it's 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. Just uh, write that one down. Lately, I've heard that Centipede and Tempest will soon be available for the Atari VCS, but I did not think this would be so since they are both rel relatively new games. They're talking about the arcade games. Oh, but they got the ability okay, because the Atari Super System can do it. At least that's the answer here. They see on, and this next question is, on certain computer games, the cassette program for one computer system won't work on another computer. Why can't that be? This kind of shows the difference between the other magazines we've read on the channel. We've read some fairly technical magazines that include code, like we have Analog Computing and some other ones by Atari. And then we also have games we've played that are type-in games from Softside Magazine. And then, of course, the tape games from Chromaset. This, kind of, this question, question kind of shows the simplicity of this magazine. This magazine is for the gamers only. Like, they, they, they're asking questions for someone who's never programmed before. Yeah, why can't I plug in a cassette on one system on another? Of course you can, because they're not programmed the same. Even if you have BASIC, sometimes there's different versions of BASIC that won't even work. If they say on one or the other. Yeah, they say, sorry, it's just not the same with programmable video games. You just can't do it. And then over here at the top, they have a comparison of Cornout Missile Command versus the home version. Why can't it look the same? That's actually pretty good. I think that one on the left is the... It might be the VCS version. Yeah, I can tell by the font. It's a VCS version. It's close to the Atari 8-bit system or home computer system. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm with you, Curtis. All right, let's flip on to the next page. Next, we've got to add for a few things. Video game cartridges wholesale. Nice. Now we can play at work once upon a time. The game designer. And then we have the, another question. I own an Atari 800 and would like to know if I can use a QuadraScan. Oh, that's more technical about the QuadraScan monitor. Question, how much does it cost to rent an arcade game and how often does he or she have to pay? Cool question, because you can do that. You can rent arcade systems. Right now, uh, it's pretty popular, obviously, and they say that there's several retailers who will sell a real live Kona, uh, such as the GAMES on the West Coast and Interlogic in the Midwest. They are hot right now. So another question is, I'm an Intellivision owner and I really like it very much. However, I noticed that other companies are producing arcade style games and I was wondering if Mattel had any future plans to do likewise. Uh, yes, they have been releasing our, our arcade style games. Oh, they mean like actual legit arcade style games with the name. They mentioned Gorf here and it's continued on page 44. So we'll see that one later. Next over here is the joystick jury section. And this is people defending or saying what is their best joystick and why. People were writing into the magazine to let them know. We have people that say the Atari con controllers and Odyssey joysticks rate the best because they get the best responses. And television is very hard to control and takes more time to learn. It's the one that has that gold disc at the bottom. TRS-80 has very poor response, it says here, to find their joysticks to be rather small. And I believe Coco, too. The Coco has a smaller joystick. This is also the case with Bally's joystick slash paddle controller. Now, this article says they think the Odyssey joysticks rate the best because they allow one to, uh, to do hard maneuvers with relative ease. My guess is they said that because of games like Moon, uh, Monkey Shines and Pickaxe Pete. 
those two games are one of the first games that have a jumping and pickaxe pete in particular is a side scrolling platformer that you can duck and jump and do a lot of different uh, movements what's up steve how's it going most Cornout games have a type of controller designed to work optimally for one particular machine, and that's why the arcade way is usually the best way, because it's made for that game itself. Let's flip on to the next page, and they now start talking about the Astro controllers or Astrocade controllers. If you've ever held those, if you see what they look like, the, the end knob is an analog control, but you can also twist it left and right. It's uh, it, it's ingenious. It's more closely tied to something we've seen like the Fairchild Channel F. Oh, that's true. The original ones. By 1982, they made some better ones, right? Like for Missile Command. But yeah, the Missile Command would be... That was a Polaris on the, the Coco. That was really, really good. Especially for the time. All right, so uh, they go through some more different coin-op uh, and, and comparing controllers over here. Uh, and then they also talk about the Odyssey 2 controllers again and Atari controllers. Lots of different ones that you can be playing on. And when we're here on the channel, I do keep consider that whenever you're playing the game because obviously we're going from game to game to game and we don't have the controllers in front of us. But whenever you play them yourself, it's a different experience on e either one. Like when you go from a computer, the ZX Spectrum, with the Chiclet keyboard and you're playing a game, but then you go to an Atari joystick, it's a totally different experience. Essentially, you can do the same thing, though you move in different directions, but it, it does affect how you play the game. And then we have the next issue, what's going to happen next, that you can write in about. The joystick jury, and uh, yeah, you can see the deadline to write those in. So get them in now. The home arcade controller, and this one allows you to switch between, uh, is that uh, Astro Blast Rapid Fire? So you can, oh, it has the uh, knobs. You can go between paddle controls and uh, joystick controls. Fancy. Let's flip on to the next page. It's now Inside Gaming. Now, this is all about Inside Gaming and the world of Muse software. They're talking about Castle Wolfenstein. That's the big one. And the man, Silas Warner, who did uh, Castle Wolfenstein. Got some cool artwork here for sneaking in. Oh, is that us in the striped suit? We didn't look anything like that in the game. But then they bring out some other games that Muse Software's done, in, like Robot War, which is another really impressive one. I would say uh, almost too complicated because you're essentially going to be programming robots. And this is kind of cool that they're giving some props to Muse Software because Silas Warner and what he did is some of the best games you could play. All right, let's go to the next page. Next, we have the Glossary for Gamers. <laughs> this is funny. T testing your knowledge to see, again, how smart you think you are. Every hobby has uh, their own language of specialized terms and slang expressions. And electronic gaming is a relatively new pastime. Here's a few words and phrases that may be unfamiliar to newcomers, like the action button. What is that? The arcader. <laughs> Some of these are really easy. Basic, of course, is the high-level language used by programmers. Chess computer is one of the computers that uses the microprocessor to play a classic strategy game, but not used for other computer applications. They talk about, see, these these definitions can, again, show you the uh, the level of complexity the, the issue of this magazine is compared to others. I, though, if I was a, a young kid at this time in 1982, this is the magazine I would enjoy and want to read. I'd be soaking all this up. Look at this. What is a ROM cartridge? A programmable video game. A monoplanar keyboard, flat pressure sensitive board used to, it's the one like the Odyssey 2, which is terrible. If you ever wanted to type something on the Odyssey 2 keyboard, it's just terrible. I've never heard it referred to as a mono monoplanar keyboard, though. Then we have the senior video game system, software, standard video game system, standalone games, tape, video game, and voice synthesizer. Nice. Uh, and then we move on to our next page. This is the reader's reply, which is just writing in to the editor and asking him uh, some stuff. They've heard rumors about the new game for the Atari VCS called Graves Manor. And Graves Manor eventually is going to become a haunted house, which we've already seen for the time. And they see they also are restructuring it to release Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is going to be coming out soon. And I have uh, all fingers and toes crossed uh, if we can get the creator of not just E.T., but Raiders of the Lost Ark, Howard Scott Warshaw, to join us. He said he was interested, but he obviously has a very busy schedule. We also have a letter to uh, talking about adventure with a hidden message or the Easter egg in adventure. I think they brought it up here on Electronic Games four or five times. Have you heard about the Easter egg in Atari's adventure? <laughs> it's 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 here a lot. 
And over here in history, regard in your history of video games in the article, A Decade of Programmable Video Games, I thought you might be interested in some facts concerning computer space. Now, they say Nolan Bushnell was the chief engineer on the project. The name was developed and introduced by Nutting Associates of Mountain View, California. Another engineer who should receive some credit was Ted Dabney. Someone's shouting out Ted Dabney here. That's awesome. Nutting Associates unveiled computer space in November 1970 and ultimately produced well over 2,000 units. Hardly a failure for their first effort. In fact, there are still computer space games out there collecting quarters. What? In 1982? That's so cool. I know there's one at the National Video Game Museum in Frisco, Texas. But I don't think it's playable. I think it's just there to see the, the curves of computer space. And yeah, I, I would be really excited if we had Howard Scott Warshaw on the show to play games with me. That would be, uh, be insane. All right, let's flip on to our next page. Grand Slam. This one's all about the world of baseball video games. And which one is the best? They just rave and rave about Major League Baseball for the Intellivision, and why not? It's the baseball game that has the license of the MLB, and uh, they break down some other baseball games like Baseball Strategy by Avalon Hill, Electronic Baseball, and then there you go, Home Run on the VCS. And we played all of these, and I'm with them. Major League Baseball is the best baseball game you could play for the time. <laughs> oh, is that him as the umpire? Yes! Love it. <laughs> All right, let's flip on to the next one. It's going into more about some other baseball games or baseball history. Tornado Baseball is another one we've seen in the arcades. And the first round or type of games we saw for baseball were almost like Pong or Breakout. You know, you just you know, have a bat that moves and you have to get the ball to bounce in a certain place. But it's not true baseball games. We've now seen games that play more like baseball. And there's the Odyssey 2 Baseball down here in the center of the screen. And then they also talk about the computer games, which is a nice touch. We haven't seen really action games too much on the computer. Um, there's been a few that have been pretty simple baseball games. But the majority of them have been strategy games, like the ones by Avalon Hill or SSI. That's the one where you design your own players. And they're based on board games, not necessarily a video game, like in more modern sense, I guess. All right, let's go to the next page, which is tips for pack maniacs. Imagine a time where you wanted to get tips on how to play Pac-Man better. How do you gobble up more points? And who in the world is that on the shoulder? <laughs> that does not look like Pac-Man. That looks like evil Pac-Man. Arcades across the country show clearly that Pac-Man is the number one coin-op video game. And yeah, it's got its own song on the, the pop charts, at least in North America. 48 million quarters per week are going to Pac-Man machines. That's a cool $12 million or annually $600 million a year for just Pac-Man. What's behind Pac-Man fever? It's probably impossible to know for certain why Pac-Man has surpassed all other games in history. If anyone actually knew the formula, they could consistently produce top-selling games. And all the manufacturers have had their share of clunkers. <laughs> this, is, this is just bizarre. That It's, it's a world where Pac-Man or maze games are, it is the craze. So cool. Here is the Coleco Tabletop, which we've already played and showcased on the channel. Lots of fun. I would say one of the best handhelds you could play at the time. And what's this? Kickman is here. High resolution arcade game. And then they're breaking down some strategies and tips on how to play Pac-Man better. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ken Ustin. Oh, nice. Do you remember what the name of the book was? We are doing magazines here and there on the channel. We I wasn't going to go into books, but we every now and then we'll have some games that were published in books as type-in. And that's, that's something that we don't hit on as much because when I say I'm going to play every video game, that is another really big exception is the number of books and the number of games in magazines. There are so many type-in games and so many books right now that uh, I eventually had to just put halt and say, oh no, I, I just can't do everything. I'm just going to do highlights or ones that, People point out and say, you, you got to get this game that's a type-in only from a certain book, and then I'll showcase it. But uh, other than that, there, there's so many games that uh, we don't really talk about how many books are being published with video games in them. All right, so here is Miss Pac-Man, which is also out. We played that one as well. And then we have some Pac trivia. Do you know how Pac-Man got its name? The game P Paku Paku in the Land of the Rising Sun means to gobble. If you didn't know, yeah, I've heard that one plenty of times by lots of people. 
In general, the Pac-Man tops out. Many players have assumed that a score would rise without a limit. And a Pac-Maniac named Kevin Fisher of Silver Springs has now proved differently on several occasions. He played through 250 boards, good for scores as high as 3.2 million points, and made his notable discovery that when you get to the end, you get the crash screen. The test pattern covers the right half. Yes, we all know about it now, but cool that they're pointing it out here in June of 1982. If you get that far, uh, isn't it screen 255 that it happens? Yeah, I think it's a 254 or 255, right whenever you get to the end where it can't, uh, pro it doesn't program anymore. Yeah, everything, that's true. There were so many books. I, I'm with you. Everyone and their grandma did. And I apologize. I'm getting weird things with my chat bar. It's not responding or doing what it's supposed to. So the, the chats are coming either slow or too fast for this episode. So I apologize about that. Oh, yeah. And Compute Magazine is a good shout out, too. That's a good one. Look at this one. New joystick. Yes. Down the bottom left corner. There's a lot of other secondhand joysticks, too, that are available for all these home consoles. And that's another part of the hardware that we really don't showcase too much here on the channel. I'm all strictly about the games. Let's get to the video games. Let's play the video games. Let's talk about the video games. All right, so the School for Game Doctors. This is an article that is going to tell you or show you how difficult it is to repair arcade systems. Because you go into the arcade and people are already experiencing it now in June of 1982. Some games aren't working. They're, they broke down. Oh, yeah, compute's great. And we've already played several, several games on compute that were type-in games. So even though we're not reading or showcasing the magazine, we're playing lots of games on there. This article is pretty long. It, it's Look at this. It opens up the arcade cabinets, showing you how difficult it is, what the cost is to repair arcade cabinets at the time. Electronic Games received numerous letters from readers asking about the availability of training in the field of video game maintenance. And um, I've only known a couple of people that were operators for arcade games. They had lots of arcade cabinets at their home. It is a, a, a different job than you would think. It's not just uh, as simple as it is working with a computer. You have to have like an engineering uh, background to repair arcade systems. And then uh, continue from re Reader's Replay about um, the computer quiz, precursor of the knowledge game. Thanks for taking the time to write and fill in the gaps of our historic perspective. So this is them giving a shout out to the older games that they brought up in one of the other mag uh, the earlier magazines of electronic games. And I like that they bring up computer space and they're telling the, about uh, the, the other developers that made it. Very nice. Oh, wow. That's really impressive. Usually the third party ones do not last that long. That's one reason why I usually stick with the, the controllers it's made for. And then we have the Empire of Xantor the Invincible. I don't know what this is. Battle of the Space Warriors and Furies, the Space Demons, Ultra Space on your Atari Odyssey 2 and television. Oh, uh, what is this? One time, oh wait, is this the, like a membership? Yeah, it's like a uh, a membership to get uh, blank, yeah, uh, blank cassettes. Nice touch. Yeah, good question, Manly. Whenever I'm playing all the games, most of the time I'm uh, either have a, a paddle control that's going to be controlling the, the 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 games, or I'm going to use a modern controller. Uh, if I have uh, a, a system that is going to be like mostly consoles, then I'm using a modern controller. If I do arcade systems and I get something close, I have a one of the large arcade uh, boards that I can play. But for the most most part, it's mostly modern, uh, like uh, Xbox controllers. But man, oh man, I want to have the original. That's the way to play. Introducing the National Arcade Scoreboard. How do you stack up against everyone else? And that's pretty cool. They show a few games on, oh, not just in the coin-op arcade, but in home computer or in the home consoles of seeing what your score racks up to everybody else. Very nice. Mine would have been at the very bottom. <laughs> yes, Errol. Yeah, there's so many. I've, there's, I've gone through so many joysticks too. Let's flip on to our next page. Next is Arcade America, where they talk about an arcade somewhere in America. This is Disney's Arcade Wonderland at Disneyland. And sadly, they only have a few pictures here of the Penny Arcade with some examples. And that looks like the um, uh, Zoltar from Big <laughs> inside. And you saw lots of d different arcade cabinets. Pinball, of course, was available too. They have, uh, look at that, entertaining Brayer Bear. And the arcade cabinets that you can find here are Pac-Man Deluxe Astro or Asteroids Deluxe. They flipped it around. Frog or Tempest, 
Kicks, Star, Arcade, Space Chase, Gorf. Very nice. Not the best pitchers, but cool that they're showing off some arcades around at the time. And now, the Video Game Hall of Fame. Electronic Games started this this issue. Uh, they, they've, every issue, though, they've been showing off what are the best games or their opinions of the best games. This one is they're putting in a Hall of Fame of just the best of the best. And what's interesting is some of these games we know and we, we, we refer to today as some of the best games ever. There are rules for voting the Video Game Hall of Fame. It has to have any knowledgeable electronic gamer is eligible to vote. Only one nomination shall be made by any one person. Any commercially published programmable video game cartridge, coin-operated electronic game, or microcomputer game software is eligible for nomination. I guess that doesn't include type-in games. Maybe I should have made that the requirements of my channel. It has to be a commercially published programmable video game cartridge, coin-operated electronic game, or microcomputer game software program. There you go. I need to put that in the rules. All nominations must be received in the ballot, including an electronic game magazine. A copy of facts or facsimile is perfectly acceptable. Yada, yada, yada. And then get it in by this time. And there is the ballot if you want to vote in. But here's what we got so far. Pong is on the Video Game Hall of Fame. And I'm with him. Yes, Pong should be on the Video Game Hall of Fame. While it is technically the second example, I would give the brown box as the first example of moving a, a little thing back and forth. Of course, on the Odyssey, it was there first too. But then Pong made it commercially acceptable to everybody. <laughs> if we can go back in time, Victor, we should put in the ballot, yes, for uh, which one? The Hangman on the, uh, uh, the VG5000? The one in Germany? The console in Germany? Or the Hangman that we just played, which was the... Uh, uh, yes, the Hall of Fame. The Hangman we just played, which was still pretty morose, was the... Um, now I'm trying to think of the, the title. It was Lynch Mob. Yeah, that was the one we just played recently. Let's move on to some more Hall of Famers, real ones. And then we have Space Invaders. And yes, I say Space Invaders should be in the Hall of Fame as one of the best arcade games ever. And let's press to the next one. The next game they have is Asteroids. This is from the perspective of June of 1982, so I can understand they make some mistakes in the mindset of just now, but Asteroids, I still see, yeah, it is an exceptional game, definitely worthy of the Hall of Fame. And then Pac-Man, obviously, that one has to be on there. Namco Midway, oh, with the slash in between. Too bad about Namco Midway. And then we move on to the games that you're like, wait a second, hold on. They have Quest for the Rings, which uh, most people have no idea what that is. It's not as mainstream as Pac-Man and all the other ones. And the same with Major League Baseball on the Intellivision. They're putting these here because they're very, very good. And I'm with them. This one, we have five stars. I can't. I think we give Major League Baseball four or four and a half for the time. It's, it's very good. It's just funny seeing these two in the Hall of Fame when the rest of them are still games we talk about now or everybody knows. Everyone's familiar with Pac-Man, Asteroids, Pong. And what was the other one? And Space Invaders. All right, let's flip on to the next section. We got to add for Star Strike. <laughs> My living room is going 165 miles an hour. I enjoyed Star Strike. I didn't give it higher marks because uh, for playability, it's not as impressive as the other uh, some other titles we played. But it's it's still a very good game for your television. Now we go to uh, look at the Atari catalog. What's happening in the world of Atari? And they're talking about Atari Home Computer. We got Rescue at Rigel, which we've seen on the Atari Home Computer. Crazy Shootout, we've seen that one as well. Very good time. And you can also see the prices here. This is 50 bucks for Crazy Shootout. It was a good game. Now that I see the price, though, I'm second guessing that. And then we have Rear Guard. It's available on lots of different home computers right now. We played a few of them. And then Crush, Crumble, and Chomp. This one isn't giving reviews. Notice it's just giving you a brief synopsis of what the game is. Yeah, that's a good point. Donkey Kong is out right now in the United States or pretty much all over the world. And Frogger is, yeah, Frogger should be here in North America too. So yeah, the, the Donkey Kong and Frogger should have replaced Quest for the Rings and the Major League Baseball. Probably because they wanted to have something from a console and not just an arcade. But I mean, let's face it. Here on the channel, we've been playing everything. And what comes out first on the arcade is usually going to be the best, most impressive video game. And then we have Bridge 2.0. Why are they talking about Bridge 2.0? No. Adventureland, no way. That's nice. Did Scott Adams pay to, for them to talk about Adventureland? 
isn't that strange? Yeah, when you think of the cost of games with inflation, it's 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 really expensive. And now are the, all the games are not as expensive. It really hadn't taken off the yeah, that's true. And yeah, that's it's it's gonna be more time for games to come out because here on the channel, we're playing everything as soon as it's released, when it's released. As soon as we as as soon as I find the dates. So that means we, we're going to Japan to an arcade and they're wheeling out the brand new arcade system and we're playing it right there. So not everyone knows about it. This magazine's North America, so uh we're currently on top as far as getting out games fast. But oh no, it's going to change in 83. I've seen I've seen the future. I know what's going to happen. And that's why I'm really excited for the next year because we're going to see video games released in Japan for, for uh, influencing all of the Japanese uh, of culture and changing how they play video games and make video games. And it's going to take off and then take over to the point that later the United States is going to get these games from Japan years later, like four or five years after they come out. So I'm really excited to see the cusp right when they release in Japan. Oh, another one by Adventure International. We got Mission Impossible 2. And then we have... Oh, this is Centuri. That is... Oh, Red Baron. Excellent. Vector-based first-person flight game. All right. Here's another reason I wanted to read this ma magazine, which was uh, the Player's Guide to Electronic Adventures. So now they're going to go over adventure gaming. And another highlight to this game, this magazine. This magazine shows you all kinds of games, not just the arcade games or the console video games. <laughs> yes. Right here in the side. <laughs> oh, yes, the pizza. Oh, man. And right now, Nolan Bushnell is not a, the head of Atari. He's currently in charge of Chuck E. Cheese. I don't know what his other ventures are, but he's 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 riding the Chuck E. Cheese train. That's a lot of pizza. Oh, that's true. That uh, Good point about when they were written. So the, the I, I'm reading the magazines when they say the publication is, but yeah, m most likely every magazine that says June 1982, th they're going to be March or April, you know, uh, whenever they're written and whenever they're re uh, released. All right, great artwork there. Let's flip on to the next page. What do they have to say about adventure games? Oh, yes. The birth of a phenomenon. They break down from the very beginning with Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, that's true. Galaxian should have been on there as well. Galaga was a little newer in Japan. I I know that it's now in North America, but it's it's just it's it's brand new in North America. But yeah, Galaxian and Galaga should have been up there, or maybe Galaxian even more. And then we have uh, Tunnels and Trolls Rune Quest and Chivalry and Sorcery. Thousands of folks vicari vicariously plunging into worlds of fantasy where magic works and only strong swords keep evil at arm's length. Role-playing goes electronic. And then they talk about the beginnings of role-playing video games, which is interesting because they first started talking about adventure games. And I thought it was going to be text adventure games. <laughs> yes, it is rigged. Why did they put... Now, Quest for the Rings is very good for the time. And Major League Baseball, though, uh, yeah, uh, it is rigged. So this is almost talking about our history here on Chronologically Gaming, how they go electronic. They're, they're talking about the first system, uh, first home computers, TRS-80, Apple II, and then the Atari home computer. Oh, where's the, where's the Commodore pet? <laughs> is there no Commodore love in this magazine? And the original uh, role-playing games that came out there. Some great artwork they have in this magazine. Love it. And then from mainframe systems to Scott Adams. Another shout out to Scott Adams. Well done puzzle adventure games. Cornerstone of the line is Scott Adams Adventures, which have reached even a dozen at the latest count. Adventureland's a good place to begin with because it's based on Colossal Cave. Oh yeah, the dungeon crawler RPGs. Were you a big fan, uh, Errol, of the uh, Dun Dungeon Quest series? Or Hellfire Warrior and all those because that would be if you wouldn't play, if you weren't playing Ultima or Wizardry that would be the other big role playing game that you check out unless you were playing Sword Thrust that's another one that's uh, really popular well I shouldn't say popular it's another one that's out there that's immense and large uh, then we also have the Empire of the Overmind which is another text adventure game that one's okay for the time. I didn't give it as much props because one thing that sets the ad adventure games or text adventure games apart right now is the text parser and how well they're programming, not necessarily the story. Because if you have ease of use to get into the text adventure game, then it works great. For example, we played a text adventure game that was written, written pretty good for the ZX81, but you're playing on the ZX81. So typing in, was it was clearing the screen after every letter. So even though the game's written well, it just didn't play as well. 
And then we have OO Topos, which we've seen as well. And Cyborg, which Cyborg are they talking about? Newer Cyborg, I don't see which one. Because um, the only Cyborg I'm thinking of is the one we played on the TRS-80. Oh, Fantasy, yes. We'll, we'll be seeing those later. <laughs> yeah, right? Yes. It's the beginning. Thanks to Arnold Schwarzenegger, we're going to see so much Barbarians everywhere. Next, Talking Evil with Sword and Joystick. Adventure Gaming meets Arcade Gaming, or Action Arcade Gaming. Combining the two together. And then we have the House of Usher, which there is... Are they pointing out any other game besides House of Usher? This is the uh, House of Usher is by Crystalware, which is a, a pretty cool game. It is buggy as hell and can crash at any, at any moment. But if you haven't seen House of Usher or the other titles by Crystalware... Check the link down below for all the games we've seen so far and look and just see some footage of it because I get like chills. It feels almost like I'm playing something like Legend of Zelda because it's a top down. You're moving around and it, they're, they're slightly incorporating action role playing or action adventure. It's just like a little sprinkling of it of it there. It's just impressive that it, they've, they've they've tried that. Oh, Moria. Yes, we will be seeing Moria. Wait, no, Moria is already out on mainframe. So if you played it on mainframe, yeah, you, you'd be playing that already. We haven't seen it on a home computer yet. Uh, but we also haven't seen, we've seen plenty of roguelikes, which I really enjoy those. But the roguelike scene um, is, is more prevalent on mainframe or larger computers. At home, though, I was surprised that the first game we played that was a roguelike wasn't Rogue. It was uh, Beneath Apple Manor. And we had another one we played just called uh, Dungeon for the Commodore Pet. So there's there was a lot of roguelikes that I thought Rogue was first, but nope. And Saving the Damsels in Distress. Look at this artwork. It's so cool. And what game are they talking about for this one? Earlier action adventure games produce attractive graphics for the Apple II and Atari home computer. And then we have the Interstellar Avenger Fights Alone, which is what? Considerable armor, joystick makes it for the surprisingly wide range of movement. Oh, okay, so they're talking about the the how limited you are whenever you do an action or role playing game or action adventure game. Oh yeah, thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, that's true. If you did, if you do see the footage from what we had played before, role playing games and dungeon crawlers, we die a lot. There's a lot of death here. And then over here on the bottom is the adults only section. Adventure gaming isn't all slaying dragons and freeing planets. For those old enough to handle a decidedly R-rated game, Online Systems has, once again, uh, is, is Ken and Roberta Williams just uh, plugging this game over and over again? Soft Porn Adventure. That's right. And you have to seduce three women. Not exactly Lord, Lord of the Rings, but a lively change of pace nonetheless. And then I don't know what game they're showcasing in the bottom right corner. I've never seen those aliens before. Let's press on to the next page. Next one is... Ultimate Electronic Adventures, adding visual dimension. And they're talking about adding graphics to the text adventure games, i.e. Uh, 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 Wizard and the Princess, all the high-res adventure games by online systems. So cool. That's what's the future, what's happening next. And then Cranston Manor is another really good one. That one is, are they giving the credit to it? I think that's Adventure International. No, High-Res Adventure 3, that's still Sierra Online. But then they, they give a shout out to Alibaba. That one is way beyond. Uh, oh, wait, Alibaba is a different one. Not Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. This is the one that was the uh, graphic. Just uh, some pictures on top. Yeah, isn't the artwork incredible? Look at this. That just gets you in the spirit. I want to play some dungeon crawl games. Multiplayer adventures arrive. Wizardry, the big one. Ultima, look at that. They have the front box. I believe that's the original. No, no, not the original original, but uh, the, the, the newer box. And then Empire One World Builders. Oh, gosh, that's a huge game. Exploring the known universe. Who knew? All right, let's keep going to the next one. See, this is all about adventure games or role-playing games. Adventures, Cartridges of Wonder. And this is playing these kinds of games on home consoles. Like they say, the Atari VCS. And the game they are talking about is Adventure, the Warren Robinette game, where you get to play as a pixel. Or four pixels, just smashed together. And then we also have the Ringmaster for Quest for the Rings. They have to talk about Quest for the Rings again. It is pretty big right now. And then over here, we got to add for some few uh, Magnavox Odyssey. Look at it, Intellivision's 250 right now. It is expensive. <laughs> oh, that's right, Telengard. We will be playing that one whenever it does come out. It's coming out close. All right, let's flip on to the next page. 
where you t- where they were going to talk about the coin world of arcade games. Deluxe Asteroids, Space Invaders, Defender, Stargate. We've seen all this. Venture, Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man. And then, oh, look, at we got screenshots of Turbo down here. This must have just recently come out in North America from Sega. Nice. And pretty soon we're going to start the, the, the arcade war between Namco and Sega. Oh, man, it's going to be so exciting. And then they're talking about Eliminator, another one we've, we've seen on the show. And uh, every single one of these is uh, links down below. You can just do a quick search for all the games we've seen up to this point. If you just want to get a, a quick sh- uh, shot of what the game looks like. Very fun. And then we got the Miss Pac-Man spread. I believe this is the same one we we checked out whenever we played Miss Pac-Man early this year. There she is. The hottest femme fatale. At least that was the ad. There it is. Yeah, the new femme fatale of the game world. <laughs> Wearing a boa. And then we also... Have, there is Turbo. I was going to see when they were going to talk about it. Yes, this viewpoint of Turbo is so big. I'm going to go back to the screenshots because this is... Reminiscent of one of the big biggest titles we're going to see this year, and I'm so excited. Pole Position is coming up, and Pole Position takes this and turns it into even something more in, in the future, or feels like you're playing something from the future. So really excited for that. <laughs> no, she looks like she's being pimped out right now. That's what she looks like. <laughs> I enjoyed Tur- Turbo because I wanted to see what else they were going to scale at the screen as you go into different areas. It's the other new the new craze with arcade games. I want to see what's next. I want to see what the next level is. That's that's the draw. Not so much how many points that is up there, how I'm getting points, but I want to see what else is in the game. And we also have Armored Car, which, why oh, did they bring that up by Stern? Armored Car is okay, but it's not that good. You can see Dodge them and Pac-Man, but then Kick-Man, or Kick, depending on where it was released. That's the one where you play as the clown picking up the balloons. And if you want to subscribe, here's how we, here's, here's how we subscribe to Electronic Games. Subscribe now. Man, I would. In 1982 for sure. Next is the Strategy Session. This magazine has everything. Strategy video games. Now, their definition is a little different. What are they talking about? Missile Command? That's not really a strategy game. That's action. They have Warlords. Yeah, Space Chase. And I guess they're talking about just war-style games. This is not what I'm talking about. Uh, playing a computer gaming world or reading the magazine Computer Gaming World, that's real strategy games. Yeah, I like the cabinet for Kick as well. And they also talk about Space Battle. Over here we got an ad for The Logical Gamer, TV's Direct. Man, I, I miss these old, older ads in the small corner. Paying uh, le- not as much money, but um, I just remember in, in magazines flipping through and wanting to find either good deals or get information because this is where you got it right here. Then we got Space Chase and Space Battle. Again, what are they talking about? Strat- this, these aren't strategy games. We know what real strategy games are. Next is Playing With Time. Yes, strap a mini arcade to your wrist. And the first thing they're going to talk about is the Nintendo Game & Watch. Here on the channel, we play the first release, which was in Japan. But Nintendo had a presence in lots of places all over the world. So the Game & Watch very quickly was all over the world, not just in Japan. Look at this. We have the widescreen version of Octopus, Missile Strike. And they're bringing up some other ones where you can play video games on your wrist. Remember those really small sports time video games that were uh, tiny LCD screens? I think they should have a screenshot of them. There we go. Yes, there it is. Look at that. Did you ever play those? I only know uh, knew a couple of people that had these, but I never even played them. I just saw them on the wrist and thought, you could play a video game on your wrist? Yes, game time watches. Sports time and arcade time. Oh, Yes. (laughs) <laughs> That's true. And the, the best way is just have a bunch of them in, in your bathroom. Just have them have them all ready. And then they're, they're bringing out lots of different games. Look at this. We have uh, Play Watch, Blackjack, Poker, Fortune Teller, Fishing. Uh, to tell you the truth, I wasn't able to be, to, to get these handheld games. So it is, uh, it is a feat to get handheld just in general. But I wasn't able to play or showcase any of these. Arcade time, sports time, or game time. So what you see here is what we're going to show uh, on the channel. And then we got the new products coming out. What is coming out? The Lestick by Datasob. Is that it? That is a joystick. That is massive. Video game scoreboard labels, too. Very impressive. Yes, fill out the uh, reader service card. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> 
Oh, and we got ads for organizing your video games, like put them in, putting them in the right order. I would be all about that. That's uh, actually one of the reasons I'm doing the channel is I was able to organize all these video games and get them cataloged. And then we got some new products by Synsonics, Electronic Musical Instruments. Had never even heard of that one. And even more new products. We have the Atari 830 Acoustic Modem. Put your whole telephone on that. And then we have calculators and then some cool swag there. I need to buy that for my wife. I love Pac-Man. She loves Miss Pac-Man. Maybe I can find that one. And then we have the Programmable Arcade. That's right. Grand Prix, the latest from the creator of Fishing Derby, Laser Blast, and Freeway, David Crane of Activision, has finally given the VCS owners an auto race game they can love. Grand Prix blends the most sophisticated graphics ever seen in a VCS program with superior action, sound, and playability. Wait a second. Now, in my research, Grand Prix wasn't going to be released until closer to the holiday season, like around November, maybe October. But are they saying it's released now? Is Grand Prix out? How are they rating and playing the game? I'd like to know. Yeah, it says it's a blast to play, like it's out now. All right, and then they also have Astro Smash, which we've already played Astro Smash. Yeah, there's Grand, Wait, Grand Prix's already out? See, this is another reason I like to read the magazines. Because that lets you know, if this is the June issue, then they were, they were playing it by May. They had to have been. <laughs> no, it is. Yeah, it's got to be really hard to use that. Oh, man. I don't even want to know the pain. And we have Space Armada. Oh, here we go. We got Pac-Man. Now, Pac-Man. Oh, right, here we go. This is fantastic. Look at this. All right, folks. First, the bad news about the most eagerly awaited video game of all time. Atari's VCS version of Pac-Man neither looks nor sounds anything like the coin-op original. The graphics are clunky. And unsophisticated, there's no changing bonus items such as cherries, limes, keys, but simply an orange square with a blue dot inside. And the sounds, except for an inappropriate metallic boing whenever the gobbler consumes a pill, are virtually non-existent. Joystick response in all game variations, but especially game one, is horrible. Getting the gobbler to drop down through an opening is an ordeal. I don't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> the goblins blink constantly, making them difficult to see, and their eyes do not look in the direction they're seeing or traveling, but simply rotate through four positions. Now, what about the good news? This is awesome. They're talking about the VCS. Uh, <laughs> yes, this is this is amazing. Oh, thanks, Errol. I appreciate it. What about the good news? There's a gobble game available for the Atari VCS. Beyond that, it's disappointingly difficult to find anything positive to say about this game, considering the anticipation and consideration time of the Atari designers had to work on is astonishing to see a home version of classic arcade contests so totally devoid of what gave the original its charm. Wow, this is amazing. Yes, confessions, right? Telling us how bad we already knew that we know that now, but it's so cool seeing them point this out in, in, in at this time. In the coin op classic players maneuver the hungry Pac-Man around a labyrinth stocked with pills patrolled by rabbits. Yeah, we know how Pac-Man works. What they should have advertised was Ghost Hunter for the Atari home computer. That is the awesome Pac-Man that you should have been playing. But by this point, Pac-Man was just released for the Atari home computer. And like we said, this was probably written around April or May. So they probably didn't have it yet. But I'm sure we're going to talk about it next, next issue. Then we have Super Breakout. Oh, yes. Tell me, gamers, how often does the VCS version of a popular coin-op classic not only measure up to, but surpass the game which is played? Yes, Super Breakout surpasses normal Breakout. And next is the Computer Playground. Android Avengers attack from all sides. This is Crazy Shootout, which we've seen. That's a pretty fun one. I don't remember any of this. In, is this an artwork for Crazy Shootout? This is the time where we're using our imagination, and the, the artwork definitely helps, but uh, this has nothing to do with Crazy Shootout. Cool artwork, though. Very sci-fi. Everyone in the future in 1982 wears full leotards. That is a very good point. Now that we know uh, a little bit more about Pac-Man, it, it is very impressive. Same with the other ones that Howard Scott Warshaw had to go pump out really, really fast. All right, so that's a lot about Crazy Shootout. Very cool. Let's go to see what else they have. What else are you going to talk about in the computer world? Protector. Very nice. Protector is a really fun one, too. Uh, Captivity is one I don't remember as well. This one is a, uh, a slash 3D maze slash adventure, but it's just very, very slow and very clunky. I, I didn't enjoy it at all. Uh, of all the games we, we played to this point, I gave Captivity two stars. It was bad. 
And then we got some awesome artwork. Look, more sci-fi. Blowing up volcanoes. So cool. And then we have Protector. That's the one by Synapse Software. Very cool. Let's move on to the next one. They're, they're bringing out lots of computer games. Look at this. County Fair by Datamost. And then Ricochet. Here it is. This one keeps being brought up in magazines, but I don't get the appeal. Ricochet is um, an, a, an interesting idea because it's an original idea kind of based on Pong where you're bouncing back and forth, but it's strategy. It's a turn-based game where you move your paddles to redirect and ricochet the balls, but it's just not executed very well. So I'm wondering if I'm phased and I'm not really putting myself in 1982 time. <laughs> yes, right? Oh, Protector 2. Yes, we will be seeing that one soon. It's uh, before the end of the year. We'll see Protector 2. There's a screenshot of Captivity. That's a terrible screenshot, but you can see it's a 3D maze style game. With the, we have County Fair up here at the top. Yeah, those. if you buy it on cassette, the price is going to be a lot cheaper. All right, and then we also have the last one, which is the standalone scene. Very cool. That looks like we're going to do head-to-head -head, uh, electronic uh, sports or electronic, uh, the, the Coleco head-to-head -head games. Pac-Man Coleco is, holy cow, I did not know it was that expensive. $70 for uh Coleco Pac-Man? Wow. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. You, you were happy to have anything. And whatever you did have, you played it to death. Oh, yes. Seamus 2. We'll be seeing that one. Yeah, um, we've seen Ricochet in a few of the Ar Ar Atari magazines. And then they brought it up here. I wasn't expecting that. So we have the head-to-head -head games, Pac-Man, and Eat and Run. I don't think we've seen Eat and Run. What is that? Oh, it's like a Pac-Man style game. Head-to-head -head Pac-Man game. Interesting. Another reason why I like to read the magazines. To see something I've, or hear about something I've never heard of before. A handheld that's a head-to-head -head Pac-Man game called Eat and Run. I'm going to have to check that one out and possibly slip it in if we missed it. These kind of games, though, in the top right, which is Reversey Challenger, we're not going to be able to play because it is a physical board game. We will not see those in the channel, but it is incorporating a little electronic components with it, which is kind of nice. And then we have Reversery, Reversery Sensory Challenger. Nice artwork. Oh, like the computer's playing with you. So cool. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Split Second is a sleeper handheld game of the month. The miniature Marvel has five exciting games to surprise and delight anyone. And again, another one. What is Split Second? I want to know. Space Attack is for beginners at the center of the screen, the red dot representing a force field. We've seen Space Attack, Auto Cross. I don't think we've seen Stomp. But the final game is Speedball. Look at all these handhelds. Of all the handles we've already played, there's so many more out there. And then we have coming next issue in Electronic Games. Walt Disney premieres the first big-budget video-game-oriented movie. You won't have to wait until then because the will feature a five photo-packed pages of the landmark event in the history of electronic gaming ever. There's the first report on the new video game, handheld device corn up inspired by Tron the Movie. And that's interesting because we've already seen Tron, the arcade game. So it's available in, I believe, New York and California at the time, at least. Yes, it's Electronic Othello, but the Electronic Othello was more of a, a board game that you're moving around the pieces. And then we also have the history of arcades. Oh, yeah, we'll be able to see this one. So this is the next issue. We'll see this in July. Summer has so much to look forward to, even in the magazine world. Home arcading goes king size. Plenty of our articles and features of interest to arcade addicts, plus reg regular columns like this, the, the usual ones. On sale now. And then here's what they do with electronic games. They give a reader poll and ask, you know, which sections do you like the best? And who are you? What's, what's the demographic for the people that read the magazine? I believe last issue they told us the, the general de demographic of the, the readers of this magazine. I would be one of them. Oh, yeah. There it is. Oh, they did. Oh, no way. I don't believe this. Here it is. This is it. Ghost Hunter. If you haven't seen or heard of this game, you have to check it out. Uh, look at the links down below and find Ghost Hunter. This game blew me away. Of all the games you could play in 1981, it is one of the best uh, home computer games ever. It is two-player simultaneous Pac-Man. And it's Design Your Own Maze Pac-Man. It has so many features. I was I was blown away. It, uh, it, it is the seminal way to play Pac-Man at the time. All right, it is the time. It is 1982. And then we have in with an ad for Barnstorming. 
on the uh what is this one? Oh, the vcs and that's where we're going to put our video game playing on pause this evening, playing every single video game and reading and talking about every single video game. This is another one of those uh, titles that uh, I'm, I'm just really excited for the summer, really excited to, 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 to read and learn more, even more about video games and what's going to happen next. Of all the things we've seen so far and where we've come on the channel, it's really been an awesome journey so far because we started in 1971 and to go where we are now, it, it already feels like it's picked up. Like this already feels like I'm at a really big peak, like we're at the top and, and experiencing the video game industry uh, just hitting its strides. And it's interesting that we say the top because obviously by next year, we're going to have the crash uh, and what happens after the crash. I'm very interested to see how that pans out here on the channel. But so far, we've just seen everything go up and up and up and up. And it just seems like it's never going to stop. Well, that's it for today. And like I always say, have you played Atari today? Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central. So join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.